apologize for being a little late. Uh, I was about to come in. I had just finished my talk, and uh, I had to sign checks. So uh, bills have to be paid, so that's what I did today. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to our final day, our final day of our, our Lenten mission. Um, and so uh, we'll begin uh, with prayer, of course, uh, but we'll begin with, with, with Mark's gospel. And this is from the, uh, the fourth chapter of Mark. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. On that day, as evening drew on, he said to them, Let us cross to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. A violent squall came up, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so that it was already filling up. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, rebuked the wind and the sea. Quiet, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? They were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this whom even wind and sea obey? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, on, on Friday afternoon, really Friday evening in, in Rome time, uh, Pope Francis, uh, on the steps of the Basilica of St. Peter's in an, open, in an empty, really, St. Peter's Square, meditated on this uh, section of, of Mark's Gospel and the calming of the sea during, really, an unprecedented Urbi et Orbi blessing. And a, and a prayer service. So he focuses on the phrase uh, from the, the 35th verse of the fourth chapter, when evening had come. And Pope Francis explained how our world and our lives seem to be very much steeped in darkness during the midst of this crisis and that we can find ourselves lost and afraid. He said, like the disciples in the gospel, we were caught off guard by an unexpected, turbulent storm. We have realized that we are all in the same boat, all of us fragile and disoriented. But at the same time, important and needed, all of us called to row together, each of us in need in comforting the other. On this boat are all of us. Now, if, if you don't know, in, in sacred scripture, oftentimes the boat is, is a symbol for the church. And so we, as a church, a universal church, the church throughout the world, are, are seriously affected during this unexpected and turbulent storm. And he emphasizes the point that the church needs to stick together even though we're isolated and at times alone. And even though we're together and we're together as the church, in that very same breath, we call out to the Lord that we are sinking. And our Holy Father goes on to say that the toughest thing to understand is our Lord's attitude towards all of this. That he's asleep in the midst of of all of, of the wind and the waves, that he's unaffected by the tempest. And it's not that he is unconcerned, just the opposite. He's truly concerned for all of his disciples, for all of those present. The difference is, is that he trusts in the will of the Father and his plan of salvation. 
And something I didn't know that I didn't realize that Pope Francis reminds us that Jesus was in the stern of the ship. And the stern of the ship is the part of the boat that would sink first. And it's from there, the most dangerous point, that he calms the winds and the waves. And then afterwards, he admonishes the disciples. Why are you terrified? Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And that's the same phrase that uh, our Holy Father goes and repeats over and over again. He goes back to it to emphasize it. Because it's at the heart of the matter. In many ways, we're all experiencing a type of fear. Unless you're, you're, you're Father Goyette. I talked to him just the other day. That dude is like unflappable. Right? We can be afraid of so many things, myself included. Right? I will tell you this right now. You, you look at it and you see all these people who are, are passing away and dying. And some of them are younger than even me. And I'm not, I'm not an old person or older, as the, <laughs> not to insult anybody. But I'm by no means old. But to see that people who are close to my age or even younger than me, who are dying from this, from the coronavirus, can be pretty scary. Right? We could also, too, as a part of this, be afraid of God's judgment about our lives. Nobody is perfect. Some of us struggle with sin and struggle with great sin. And so we're afraid of death because we're afraid what's going to happen next. That's okay. You know, we, we need to, to enter into that. And we'll, we'll get to that point just a little bit later. We're afraid of and, and for our, our, our children and our families. You know, I'm, I'm afraid for, for my mom and dad. You know, my mom tomorrow is, is having heart surgery. She's having bypass. You know, the prognosis is very, very good. But, hey, stuff happens. Right? I pray for my dad. My dad has Addison's disease. He has an adrenal insufficiency. So when he catches a cold, it knocks him out. Right? I can only imagine what that might do. Right? I, I, I pray for my brother's family, my sister's family, for all our families, really, that we stay safe. And we can also worry and stress over the total and, and, and complete disruption of our lives and of our faith. Right? We're, we're called to live out our vocation, our, our temporal vocation, in, in ways that we never could have imagined. And we're here, gathered together in faith, when normally this would be in the evening, and then all of us hopefully would be gathered together in church. We can even be afraid and worried about the untimeliness of it, of it all. Not that we're looking at, at, the, at the coronavirus as an inconvenience, but rather how it seems to take lives outside of the natural order of things, even though they might have uh, some other pre-existing condition or, or as the catchphrase would be, a, a comorbidity. So there's a lot of fear going on. And Pope Francis echoes the reality of our fears. He says, the storm exposes our vulnerability and uncovers those false and superfluous certainties around which we have constructed our daily schedules, our projects, our habits and priorities. It shows us how we have allowed ourselves to become dull and feeble about the very things that nourish, sustain and strengthen our lives and communities. The tempest lays bare all of our prepackaged ideas and forgetfulness of what nourishes our people's souls. All those attempts that anesthetize us with ways of thinking and acting that supposedly save us, but instead prove incapable of putting us in touch with our roots 
and keeping alive the memory of those who have gone before us. We deprive ourselves of the antibodies that we need to confront adversity. Right? We, we, we recognize that our lives at times are at a breakneck speed. That many times, especially now, that we have learned to, to retreat, to slow down, to be still. We have, at times in our lives, mistakenly thought that we were the masters of our own destiny. That we controlled the world. That with a, a cavalierness and a greed realized or thought that we chose the direction that our lives entered into. We are not in control. God is. And we need to call out to him. Not as teacher, which they did in Mark's gospel, but as Lord. And it's interesting, Pope Francis talks about the fact that the Lord is not reminding us that we need to believe in him, because we already do, right? The fact that, you know, so was, we were at 15 people watching us right now, okay, on and streaming. So you're here, we're here together to pray, right? To believe in God. That's, that's, that's a given. We're, we already have that down. We already do that. But... The, the shift is, is that we more importantly need to trust in him. It's not just enough to believe that Jesus is Lord, but to really know and trust that he is Lord, to place our trust in him wholeheartedly and with our whole entire lives, and to realize that we're going to be okay. And tied into it, of course, is the need of uniting our Lenten journey, and our need for conversion along with this trust. So here's where we're going back to it. So if we're afraid of God's judgment, right, if, there, if there's something in our lives that we need to desperately change, a sin that we are struggling with that seems to have mastery over us, then this is the time to ask our Lord for the grace and strength to turn away from sin and embrace the gospel, the message that, that we began on uh, Ash Wednesday with as we placed the ashes on our foreheads. So this trust and conversion, it's not just about placing our lives in the Lord's hands, but also allowing ourselves to be planted there, to be rooted there and to grow. So what is our level of trust in God? How are we doing in the trust-o-meter? And if our trust is lacking, how do we turn to him more and more each day? You know, I, I have found that when I am super stressed out, and let me tell you, at this moment, I'm super stressed out, that prayer is so important. Right, even this whole concept of having a holy hour, you're just like, oh, you know, do I really have to do this? I have to expose the Blessed Sacrament, right? But I'll tell you, that quiet hour, that quiet time of just reflecting and praying calms me down. And that's hard to do, right? Especially if I'm a bundle of nerves. And so when we gather together and we pray, I can't tell you how many people have said, Oh, Father, thank you for doing this, right? It, it's, it's bringing comfort. Well, guess what? It, it's a twofold street, right? It goes both ways. So prayer, of course, is important in building up trust. <clears throat> you know, if you're, if you're dating somebody or if you're marrying somebody or you're married to somebody, right? you, you, you need to get to know them and how to get to know them. Right? You get to know them by, by talking with them, by entering into conversation with them. And it's the same with God, right, to enter into that holy type of conversation. Now, Pope Francis also talks about a courageous and generous self-denial in order to place our trust in God. 
And that self-denial is grounded in the power of the Holy Spirit. Witnesses of all those in our world who are sacrificing their lives, right? Putting themselves at risk in order to take care of us in the midst of this crisis. So, of course, he talks about the doctors, the nurses, all those emergency personnel, all those that are involved and, and put their, 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 their selves at risk for our sake. So, being grounded in the Holy Spirit and, and realizing that we're not alone, we're, we're meant to, to really focus, even isolated, our interconnectedness, right? Especially with the poor and the less fortunate among us. And how we care and love for those in our care with gentleness and kindness. So in other words, it's, it's wonderful to take care of all of those who are poor and less fortunate and, and still be mindful of them and pray for them. That's another thing entirely at times to, to be kind and loving uh, for, for uh, our families and the people that we're currently in isolation with. And even in the midst of this in which we can feel totally detached, Pope Francis tells us is that we're not self-sufficient, that we just can't do this on our own. You know, we unfortunately have a rugged individualism that's rampant in our culture. All right, we, we talk about armies of one, uh, you know, just doing things on our own, being able to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. That, 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 that's the, the, the backbone of, of American individualism. But we are nothing unless we have God in our lives, that we need our Lord's presence among us. Now, he has a long quote, Pope Francis. I think it's important to talk about our, our interconnectedness and the fact that we, we need to lean on and with and for one another. So the Lord asks us, <clears throat> and in the midst of our tempest, invites us to reawaken and put into practice that solidarity and hope capable of giving strength, support, and meaning to these hours when everything seems to be floundering. The Lord awakens so as to re reawaken and revive our Easter faith. We have an anchor. By his cross we have been saved. We have a rudder. By his cross we have been redeemed. We have a hope. By his cross we have been healed and embraced so that nothing and no one can separate us from his redeeming love. In the midst of isolation, when we're suffering from a lack of tenderness and chances to meet up, and we experience the loss of so many things, let us once again listen to the proclamation that saves us. He is risen and is living by our side. The Lord asks us from his cross to rediscover the life that awaits us, to look towards those who look to us, to strengthen, recognize, and foster the grace that lives within us. Let us not quench the wavering flame that never falters, and let us allow hope to be rekindled. So we have to embrace the cross. We talked about that in the beginning in our first talk about, about Padre Pio and suffering. St. John Marie Vianney says that the greatest cross that we will ever have to carry is the fear of it. Is the fear of suffering. So embracing the cross means to find the strength to embrace our hardships and to turn away from selfishness and unheeded pride. So my dear brothers and sisters, why are we afraid? Where is our faith? And even though our faith may be weak, we recognize and understand that we have an all-powerful and merciful God who will never abandon us. Let that give us solace, comfort, and most importantly, 
God bless you. Thank you for joining us these past four days. Uh, hopefully this is just a little spiritual pick-me-up. Um, also, too, know that the diocese is starting uh, next Monday for, the, for a couple of days uh, to, to have their own Lent retreat. I'll put that information on the Facebook pages. Take care and God bless you.